Next I'll tol talk about ensemble methods. And as I already said, the Bayesian approach can be thought about as an ensemble method because there you have a posterior distribution over your parameters. So that means for each draw from this posterior distribution, you have a new network. And when you make predictions, you should in principle make predictions for each of these uh, networks that you draw from your posterior distribution. And this averaging will always give you better performance. There are many other ways to do this kind of model averaging. Sometimes they go under, under the name of backing. Uh, and what we could vary here is that we can vary both the models we use, so that could be not only deep learning, but we could also use a nearest neighbor method in, in a combination with a deep learning model, or we can combine, we can use different ways to train the network, we can use different hyperparameters in the network or different size of the network, changing different other uh, hyperparameters. And we can also simply run with different random seeds that will give different solutions. And you can of often see in papers, for example on ImageNet again, that people report what is their single model performance and what is the performance when they train an example of 10. And that is simply running the same model with a different random seed. And just this random seeding gives a substantial better performance. So of course this is something you also should do when you apply your models, uh, when you found a good a single model then to give yourself a little more juice and performance then you can run it nine more times and then average the performance of these models. There's also something called dark knowledge which has been advocated, oh dark knowledge is a name that Hinton has given it, it's not only Hinton who has proposed this. The idea is that once you have trained an ensemble, then you can actually use the ensemble prediction as a new target and train a new simpler model to mimic the ensemble. And that way you get a model that is very fast at predicting. This might be a good thing if you want to deploy your, for example, speech recognition software, image recognition software on a smartphone or in a server solution where you need, where you have a lot of users such that you actually need to have a, uh, fast computation and cannot use your favorite very, very large deep network. So dropout is a quite new technique. It's only three, four years old and uh, it has really helped uh, improving the performance of many of these classical benchmarks. The idea is very simple, very embarrassing simple. Um, simple ideas are nice. So. Of course, I would wish I had invented this because, yeah, it's just nice. So the idea is that we remove hidden units at random. So we present an example, an input, and this example comes also with a mask where we mask out some of the hidden units. So this example, you can see we mask out four of the hidden units. And then we get an output uh, from this network. So the only hi new hyperparameter we have when we perform dropout is that we have to decide how many of the hidden units we remove. So in this example we have chosen that we just remove half of the of the hidden units. This is usually a quite good number. We we see that we get good performance usually by having removing between 20% and 50% of the units. Why does this actually help? I'll show that in the next slide. Um, uh, I should also say that at uh, at test time, so we're, okay, so I should maybe explain completely to the end. When we present the next example, uh, we draw another mask and remove some other hidden units. And so that means also when we present the first example again in, an, in the next epoch, then we'll have another mask. So the mask is new all the time. When we want to make uh, predictions, then we should simulate this process and maybe do it 1000 time and then times and average the prediction over this. There's also uh, the fast and cheap way to do that and that is simply by dividing, including all the weights, but then dividing all the weights by a factor of two if we have had a 50% uh, uh, dropout rate. And that is uh, like a poor man's version of, of drawing this ensemble of many uh, different dropouts at test time. 
So here is a small illustration to illustrate why this can be a good idea. So now let's say that we trained a network, so that's on the left, to uh, like an MNIST type network here with five different digits. And the kind of feature extractors we have learned are these five in the hidden layer. And you can see that, that uh, the, there's one feature that clearly kind of gets kind of the upper part of a five. And then there's another feature, the second feature that sort of gets the lower part of the five. But in order to, uh, to uh, map the training examples correctly, it only needs uh, two vague features in order to find the five. So that means that it's this kind of the second feature is not learned to be very specific to learn this, uh, this part of the five. But if we apply dropout, then sometimes this very specific feature to get the upper part of the five is dropped out. And that means that the other parts should pay more attention. And this is what is shown in the third plot. So you can see now, after the dropout training, then both uh, hidden unit two and four will extract, extract features that are relevant to five and then will learn better to, uh, to uh, classify the five. So this is kind of the philosophy behind dropout. And we can also think about dropout as a kind of backing. So um, we have this ensemble of networks and a network where we have dropped out some features would we'll then make some prediction. And when we, in the end, combine this, uh, all these dropped out networks, then we get a network which is more precise than each of the individual networks. I just told you uh, a little while back that we actually don't do this kind of draw a bagging uh, in the end. Probably we could do it and we could get slightly better performance by this other heuristic of dividing all the weights by, uh, by two at test time, but it's much faster to do this dividing by two. So we apply that uh, at test time. Yeah, so here's a few slides, I will not talk about that. So uh, I'll almost come to the end here. So uh, adversarial learning is, uh, training is uh, another funny effect that has been observed uh, in many of these classical benchmarks. So for example, now we have trained uh, ImageNet to recognize this input as a panda, but we can also just add a little bit of not entirely random noise, but we can add this second image that you see here. This is now a magnified version of this image. But if you look at the resulting image, we get an image that to our eye is completely identical to the first image. But the funny thing now is that the ImageNet network will no longer uh, classify this as a panda, but as a gibbon. This is very strange and this is uh, shows that, that the data, uh, the classification manifold, uh, or the uh, the classification of the manifolds, the image manifold that we have learned is not robust to changes in specific directions. And here we have taken a, we have added an adversarial direction to the image. So what we have done here is we we have looked at in we have taken x our panda in, input, and then we have looked at the cost function for this, and then we have changed. Uh, the image in the direction where the cost function increases the most. And then we've just taken the sign of this increase. Uh, and then we have multiplied by a small factor. So you can see we only need a very small image added to, to this in order to, uh, to confuse the network. So, um, so uh, this could, can be thought about as a way Adding these examples, we can of course hope that the network will be more robust to uh, these, these uh, things that look the same for us, but doesn't look the same for the network. In my personal experience, I've found that it actually does not help so much on, for example, M MNIST uh, training or performance, and that's because the the, these kind of adversarial examples, they don't really exist in the, in the test set. So we are actually, even though we have found a kind of a direction in the image manifold where we are, 
where the network is really weak, we don't have any test data in those regions, so it doesn't help so much by, by adding this kind of uh, extra information. But it can, in, of course, in some, in some cases.